So, uh, welcome everyone, near and far. I am pleased today to have with us Dr. Linda Antis, a composer, arts technologist, flutist, and educator. Um, she has had performances of her work all over the place and is noted for many different things. I will read a few because they're impressive. Um, she has had works on the ICMC, uh, Seamus, she, uh, Sound and Music Computing Conference, uh, the Fifth International Congress on Synesthesia, Science and Art. She's been recognized by Musica Nova International Competition of Electro Electroacoustic Music, Fulbright, Fulbright Foundation, the Bourges Elec Electroacoustic Composition Competition, and has received commissions from the International Computer Music Association and various internationally renowned performers. So all that is very impressive stuff, if you don't know. Um, her current research involves uh, visual music, real-time signal processing, and physical computing. And I won't read too much more of her bio, um, but those are some salient points. Uh, and we're particularly pleased to have her here today and to hear what she has to say about um, her work at the intersection of music and technology, and as a fellow visual music enthusiast, um, I would also put that her work intersects art and technology from a visual standpoint as well. And so with that, I will turn it over to our guest speaker, Professor Antis. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, First, thanks so much for the invite to come share with you. It's been, again, some kind of uh, crazy times and, you know, feeling a little isolated by not being able to, you know, go out to Seamus and ICMC and, and you know, local local music of any kind. It's, 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 it's getting to be old, but I think, I think we're, we're getting close to some, some good things happening, so that's great. Um, I just want to say uh, that we do show Professor Thompson's work in my visual music class. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of his work as well. Um, so, you know, I'm coming from a background of uh, what before moving to, I'm currently at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. Um, when I moved out here to Montana, I had lived everywhere from Seattle to Barcelona and a few places in between, primarily in the Midwest. And I used to say I was from a small town before I moved to Montana. Um, by that, I meant 19,000 people, which uh, in a lot of Montana is actually a fairly sizable <laughs> community. Um, you know, grew up with, uh, I want to say the band tradition was kind of more my musical home. Uh, although at the religious school that I attended for K through eight, um, you actually got taken out of whatever academic class you were in to be in band. And so my parents said, you're not going to be in band. Um, so my early musical training was actually uh, taking flute lessons at uh, the music store in, in the mall a town or two over. Um, so that's how I got my start. Um, I still love playing the flute. Um, uh, kind of later in life, I've picked up on the guitar um, for, you know, singer songwriting kind of stuff. And that's been really fun. I've actually um, been kind of focusing on that because I know there are no concerts I'm going to go out and play flute at for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I figured between my sabbatical last academic year and these strange times we're in, Let's make some lemonade. Uh, so just started kind of focusing on that. And actually, I'm studying um, guitar formally now with a, uh, a music tech graduate. So one of my former students is now my teacher. And that's actually been really fun and, and really cool. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I have a PowerPoint with, you know, just to kind of keep me on track. And it has all my examples. So go ahead and get that sharing. Oh, wait. There we go. <laughs> okay. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm really sorry. Uh, you should have the ability to do it now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you know, in WebEx, it's so hilarious when you do screen sharing. And I don't know if you do WebEx, we, we our university bought it because you can get tech support on it. Uh, 
apparently was one of the reasons, but the stop sharing your screen button is actually right next to the mute button. And the way it pops out when you cursor over it, I'd say about 50% of the time when I go to stop sharing my screen, I mute myself. So the traditional, you're muted, you're muted. Let's see here. I'm just going to go share the whole desktop in case I need to grab something else from from somewhere else. Oh no, what I have to open system preferences. This is crazy. What? Sorry. Will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit. No, we're not going to quit now. What is it complaining about? I'm sorry. Uh, here we go. That should do it. Okay, let me know if you're not seeing my screen because apparently you should be at this point. We are seeing it. Excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, this is just a, a little uh, tour of my of a few recent works that I've been doing um, that do intersect uh, arts and technology. Um, so I got really interested in sonification. Um, and I'm sure this is probably covered in, in one of your courses there at Georgia Southern in some way or another. Um, it's also known as auditory display. So it's the use of nonverbal sounds to represent data. Um, really originally envisioned to help scientists, um, you know, soak in multiple streams of data uh, because there are instances where you know, your standard pie chart or even a more three dimensional looking graph just aren't going to cut it. It's not going to be enough data points. Um, but there are so many different facets when we talk about audio um, that sometimes you can basically graph out your data as audio uh, rather than as visuals. So, um, you know, when I, I got my doctorate at the University of Washington and, uh, you know, was in Illinois basically for the first 23 years of my life. Uh, so I have, I have always been fascinated by mountains. And, um, you know, at the time that I was in grad school, not to date myself, but um, a computer wasn't really a household appliance like a toaster or a TV the way it is now. Um, you know, during a lot of my schooling, computers were a special research tool. They were really expensive. I mean, they're pretty much wasn't an internet. So it wasn't so ubiquitous that everything from like fixing your snowblower to getting a good recipe, um, you know, the computer just wasn't useful for that yet. So I'd be there in the lab, you know, uh, there's a day I didn't teach and didn't have classes, 12 hours a day, just like writing code. And uh, I'd, I'd leave the lab and I'd get on the bus to go home uh, and go, go up north to the, the cheap part of town where a grad student could actually afford to live. And if I look to my, my left or off to the west, you saw the Olympic mountain range. And if you look to the right, you saw uh, the Cascade mountain range. And of course, after all those hours of really digging in and being on the computer and examining my waveforms and cranking out some more you know, synthesized sounds, uh, and just being that kind of slap happy state, when I looked at the mountains, I literally saw waveforms. And so I think, you know, the idea for this first piece I'm going to, I'm going to talk about was actually started when I was in grad school. Um, and I, you know, didn't really have the funding or the time uh, to, to realize it until um, 2016. Uh, but I think that's where my interest in sonification probably came up that just for me kind of emotionally, there's a lot of drama and a lot of beauty in mountains, especially if you're from somewhere, you know, incredibly flat, uh, like, like uh, the part of uh, Illinois I was from. Um, and also just the, the, the rigor of it, the work, the, the, you know, I just found it so fascinating. So um, I got into that and I actually have a couple works I'll talk about today that are based on sonification. So um, I also just, you know, as a human being, I think it's, it's fairly late in our evolutionary process that we sit in front of this glowing little box for so many hours of our day. And when we're not doing that, then we have the tinier box that we can, you know, we can be watching videos while we're, you know, making dinner or walking to class or any of that. And 
Um, you know, one of one of my other interests is just studying how social media and how screens um, are affecting our psyche and affecting our learning. Um, so for me, as a human being, not that far removed from you know our cave cave people uh, era, I really need to be outdoors. Um, I get. I get really funny in the head <laughs> if I stay inside too much and if I do too much screen time and I've been very aware of it, you know, for forever. Um, so the other fun part of this, this project was the fact that I could actually go out hiking and backcountry camping and kayaking here in Montana and it was technically research. So that was really fun. Um, so I'm going to talk a little about a flute piece um, that's in three sections. Um, and each section kind of uses this GPS data that I collected in slightly different ways. Um, you know, I easily could have made a way long, way too long piece. Um, and I look forward to, you know, either collecting more da data, um, aka hiking, uh, and, and doing another piece or even reinterpreting, um, you know, some of the data that I got in this piece could be, you know, a couple few more pieces, but um, what you're screen, seeing on the screen here um, is the, you know, Google Earth. Uh, I collected data on a Garmin. I, I originally, in the grant, I had asked for um, the Arduino GPS module, and I thought, wow, that was that's really cool. I'm gonna, you know, grow it all from scratch. I actually teach an Arduino course slash Raspberry Pi where necessary um, every other spring semester here. Um, but I was really excited to just, you know, grow my own and do everything from scratch. And I got this. GPS and I'm running the test code in my room and I realized that it only worked if it was closer to the side of the window that didn't have a screen in it and I was like yeah this is not going to work in Montana so uh had to had to shell out for the real cheap GPS but um this is our track this is the Bridger Range so I don't know if it made national news but we actually had a fairly scary fire here uh, a couple few months ago called the Bridger Foothills fire that was actually in this range, although southeast of what you're seeing uh, on this photo. Although there was a different fire here uh, when I was out hiking this. So um, that's our track. You know, this is the aerial view. So you're really not seeing the altitude changes until I flip us over to here. Let me make all our little faces go away. Um, but what you're seeing here, and, and again, sonification, uh, very wonderful way of, uh, of soaking in data for scientists. And for me, again, I found it really interesting. Um, I'm not necessarily for the whole piece using absolutely all, what is it, six streams of data you get out of a standard uh, GPS unit. Um, I'm not being incredibly sciencey, uh, I guess you could say. And that's fine, because to me, I'm making art. You know, I wanted to make a piece of music that people would, you know, uh, enjoy listening to. Um, so in this first part, I think we can, we're safe to kind of focus on um, altitudes and speeds. Um, so the green line here is the altitude. And so you can sort of see that looks like a mountain, doesn't it? Um, so that's when you get up to the pass level there. And then the blue is the, um, is the speed at which you're hiking, uh, which, you know, I was a little concerned at first because, you know, I'm not like an ultra elite trail runner. People do that out here in Montana because, you know, running marathons just isn't enough. You have to run marathons up mountains out here. Um, you know, wondering like, well, there's going to be a lot of, uh, it, it, you know, the data is going to be interpreted in part by my, you know, my fitness level, right? That the steeper it is and the longer it's steep, you know, that's going to affect the speed. Um, but, you know, running the initial tests, I was like, wow, it actually sounds like fairly normal music that I would write. So that was kind of fun. But um, this first section, I'll just play you and I think you'll be able to see uh, the contour of the melody in the contour, the green line there, the contour of the mountains. And I'll just play that example for you. And 
can we repeat at a different pitch level? Um, so there it is, uh, a little piece of the Bridgers uh, as a flute piece. Um, I just, for those of you, um, my understanding is we have people that are more on the composer end and people that are more on the, um, uh, you know, CS side. Um, in that particular example, I'm actually interpolating through the data um, because I found that just musically, the shape of you know the pass and those couple ridges before you get to the pass, the smaller things that you see off to your right, um, just made a really nice melodic line. Um, so when we interpolate through the data, that just means that if we collected uh, 500 data points, and I know that I want you know this particular uh, carrying out of that phrase or maybe of an entire section to have that same shape, but scale it so it lasts the desired length that you actually are occasionally skipping um, some data points. Um, and in other sections, all three sections were really um, three different ways of uh, interpreting this data. Um, so in the second one, um, this is from a kayak trip on the Ruby River, uh, which is about two and a half, three hours uh, southwest of here. Um, and as you can see in this uh, GPS view here, it's a very, very twisted river. I grew up uh, canoeing and kayaking uh, in the Ozarks of Missouri. My hometown was very near St. Louis. So, you know, in about an hour, you're in, you know, a tiny piece of Montana uh, there in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, in that, the rivers, they turn, but I have never been on a kayak trip before where you literally face all 360 degrees. Um, so I thought, wow, well, this, this could be pretty interesting. Um, what can we do with this data? So one of the things I tried uh, and, and what the results you're going to hear in this section of the piece were um, going down the river and actually mapping whatever range of the flute uh, you would want to use onto um, your, your degrees, your heading. So, you know, zero to 360 degrees or mapped on to a chromatic scale from the lowest note on the flute to about as high as I enjoy playing. And I think most people want to hear the flute playing. Um, so that's how this next section um, is laid out. Again, here's your basic graph of just your altitudes and your speeds. Um, you can see the green is the altitude. Water doesn't flow unless there's some altitude change. Um, and of course the blue is the speed. And if you've ever done any you know, canoeing or kayaking on a river, um, you know that sometimes you're almost stuck still. Um, I actually had some weird kind of scary experiences when I would go by intakes for irrigation systems. That does some really strange things with the current. Um, but, but there are moments on, on a river where you suddenly go really fast and there are moments where you're almost at a standstill. Um, you can see the altitude is fairly boring and that's great because if you are on a river, especially out here in the Rocky Mountains and your altitude changes too suddenly and too sleepily, you've probably just gone over a big waterfall and that could be super bad news. Uh, so the green line in this one is a little boring. The blue line, the speeds are a little more interesting. Um, and here is what that ended up sounding like. <laughs> So there's a little of that. And you know, the faster notes you hear there are literally, you know, little moments where uh, we went downhill a little quicker and, and picked up some more speed. Um, the last section of the piece, and the whole piece, if you're if you're curious to hear what it sounds like as a whole, um, is uh, look me up on SoundCloud. Um, I have uh, it's actually a live performance from SCI. 
uh, when was that New Mexico, spring of 2018, 19, something like that. Um, so this last section, um, you actually, you know, my husband had the great idea. Uh, let's just for giggles, let's put this GPS unit into uh, our black lab at the time was probably about eight months old when I was collecting the summer I was collecting data uh, for this project. And this is her actually, this is actually on Ross Pass. Um, I don't, this isn't the trip that we collected data on. This is a different hike, but you can see she's using her little sister, the yellow lab as a pillow, and she's got her backpack on there. Um, I discovered that a dog that people hike roughly 60% of what a youngish healthy dog hikes. Um, so then Mike had the idea why don't we toss that GPS in her backpack and, and let's just see what happens. So um, this is actually in the foothills of the Bridger Mountains. Um, and if you look at if you look up MSU's website, and you see the big M on the side of the mountain that that's the bridgers there. Um, so the M is kind of maintained by MSU students and they go up every fall and they repaint all the rocks white. Um, but this is at a dog park near there. Um, it's actually it used to be a garbage dump, but it's been you know, kind of revamped and uh, my hometown did this even made a park out of the old uh, landfill. But it's, it's again, you can't really see from this image, but it's, it's very hilly. Um, so um, this data was collected um, at the dog park with Indy running around to her heart's content and being a total goofus. And um, again, you can see the green lines are kind of the overlay uh, of the altitude uh, changes not not quite anything as dramatic as the first section of the piece, um, but for this one, um, I decided to shake it up just a little. And this section is actually derived from not just interpolating through the data or taking point for point all the data. It's actually more of like an improv uh, of me using the mouse to kind of scroll through the altitude and speed data. Um, and, you know, it took several passes till I will, was happy with the performance, but, but that's, that's how I got the third section of the piece is actually based on the GPS data, um, but kind of uh, in, interpreted by, by mouse X on the fly. <laughs> So that's uh, the third and final section, obviously not all the way to the end, but just a little a little taste of what that third section um, is. And so I think maybe um, before we go on, uh, if anyone has any questions now, while it's fresh in your memory, might be oh, a good time I, for questions. I actually about just, that particular piece. I just put it in the chat, but I was wondering if you could elaborate more on how you chose, to, like what parameters of sound that you chose to associate with what parameters of the data that you've collected? Like, how did you decide what corresponds with the pitch and what corresponds? I think you touched on it a little bit, but it sounds like there's a lot of details going on. So I figured a lot of intentionality. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, when you're in full screen sharing mode, uh, I don't know how to set it up to where I see the, the chats or the raised hand. Uh, but great question. Um, you know, it was a lot of experimentation. Um, it was, you know, as you know, first of all, just getting your code to run. And then once you have that basic framework of code that runs, um, it's pretty easy, um, you know, in the coding language to say, oh, well, um, instead of taking the data stream, that's the uh, headings, zero, zero to 360, uh, and making that be pitch, let's just plug in, you know, some other factor. 
Um, so it was a lot of kind of digital sketching um, and just running straight from the software that I, I coded this stuff in. Um, out, it, it feeds into logic and I just listen on a, a generic piano sound just to you know, kind of kind of hear what was coming out. So yeah, it was just a lot of experimentation. And in the end, um, the first and third sections are, you know, kind of doing the obvious, right? I mean, speed was speed and altitude was pitch. Um, mm -hmm. In the second section, I do have parts where if um, certain things like, oh, this, this is a four-year-old piece, so I'm a little foggy, but I think it's coverage over ground. If it reached a certain threshold, um, it would trigger like a flutter tongue. And then, um, because I didn't want it to all be flutter tongue, right? So I set the threshold fairly high. So it could be more like an accent or a little special feature, uh, or there are certain data points that when they reach the threshold, they'll trigger a trill in that second section. But, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to out science scientists. This, this is, like I say, a, a fun way of mashing up my love of nature and my kind of inherent inner geekiness and, um, you know, coming up with some piece of music people would want to hear. So yeah, just a lot of, a lot of experimentation and, and trying things out and giving it a listen and, you know, adjusting. So, um, since the last time I had used this software to do a piece, I was I was really thrilled. Um, it's one of these open source free programs. It's it's called Common Music, um, but they had really added in a lot of features. Um, so a lot of things that I thought I was going to have to code from scratch were now a part of the part of the software. So like, um, sorry, let me let me go onto my other computer here. Um, let's see. Rescale, so the, like the rescale feature, really, you know, really basic, like, um, you know, map from this altitude, like I'm looking at some code here, map from 6545 to 7721, so that was the altitudes of um, the first section, map that onto lowest note and highest note, right? So, you know, depending, do you want a melodic line that spans three octaves, you can, you know, really easily scale that. Or, I mean, all the way down to, if you want it to span a perfect fifth and have tons and tons of microtones, you, you could do that too. So, you know, it was just a fun process of, of, of taking the data and, and playing with it. So, are there any other questions? Like I say, I'm having a hard time getting into the, the chat from your, yeah. do you have any other? I, I have two questions. To ask you, uh, the first one is: Are are all your pieces like based or inspired by landscape, or at least is your main source of ins inspiration? Mm. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things that inspire me, and I again I think they're they're closely related as well. But um, generally speaking, the natural world, um, yeah. So hiking, nature, um, and also um, Indo-Tibetan Buddhism is another big influence for me. I don't know. You got you got my little meditation space. Right we, my love desk Tibet there, here. So we love Tibet. We love There's my green Tara. Really? Do tell more. Well, we like Twin Peaks, so. <laughs> Twin Peaks. You know, I missed out on that. When I lived in Seattle, I had a friend that had to go to that little diner in Snoqualmie or some some little town, like, to eat the pie, because it was where everybody on that show went to eat pie, and I, I don't know, I just wasn't into it. But yeah, so that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from. And you said you had another question, yeah? Yes. Um, so these examples that you showed us, uh, how can I explain this? Um, like the texture was kind of similar, right? Um, and I see that the, for example, in this graph that you are showing now, like the melody takes the, the shape of the, that chord, right? And what, what about the, the background that I think the, the three pieces that you showed us has, have this background and a melody? Uh, how is that background related mm -hmm. to, to the graph? Or, uh, 
Yeah, great question. You know, uh, and I forgot to get to my last slide, I guess, which would have answered your question. There are some examples um, of actually using those altitude curves as a waveform. Um, so, so let me just, let me just, so this is that same Ross Pass. So the first section uh, where we get the big, the big peak and then the two smaller ones. Um, and one of the kind of, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of like droney sounds in there. And one of them is made from that. And that's this sound. You know, so that's, that's like what you're hearing at, at the beginning of the piece. But other than that, it's kind of a standard musique concrète uh, piece where I recorded, oh, my electric guitar and uh, our cello professor um, playing some things on cello. And I can say it's been four years, so I'm a little foggy, but um, most of the sounds in the piece are generated the way I generate the sounds in most of my pieces, which is to say basic musique concrète techniques of recording things and manipulating, uh, manipulating them beyond all recognition sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, do we have any other questions before we go on? It looks like there's a question in the chat. It says, um, this is from Alex, and he says, these pieces remind me of the Fibonacci sequence. Have you drawn inspiration from mathematics and nature by, by chance? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was Francisco's question too. Um, absolutely. And one of my first composition teachers, sorry, that, that glow there. Oh my goodness, that's getting in my way. Um, what my undergrad composition teachers um, at University of Illinois named Bill Brooks, and I think he's teaching over in York uh, in the UK now. Um, he was actually a double major in mathematics and uh, composition, and I'm not sure how high his degrees in math went, but I can remember my freshman year of undergrad uh, for music technology majors were really, I think, um, so a lot of the electronic Music. Even to this day, a lot of it is happening in the composition department. You know, kind of analogous to the way that um, filmmaking at one point was housed in, um, in in the English department, right? Because it's a way of telling a story. You're just doing a film. Um, but yeah, so my freshman year in composition lessons, uh, Professor Brooks uh, set me up with the Fibonacci. Uh, and I immediately started using it in practice. Now, it's been quite a while since I used it, uh, but it's definitely something I have done. I do. so. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Brian, can you mute your microphone, please? Yeah, somebody needs to mute. I heard it too. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Can sorry, you I bumped it. it. We're good. All okay. right. Nice and quiet now. All right, and I finally, sorry, I finally found where to where to find my chat. Fibonacci series, how's the data sound? Okay, I think we got through these. Okay, I think we're good on questions for now. So let me uh, let me forge ahead a bit. Um, the another recent project I did um, was an installation. Um, called NeuroCave, and um, it was a collaboration between, uh, I think, kind of the, the founding idea. I have a colleague in art. She's a painter. She actually lives just down the road from me. Um, she kind of had this original concept. She got really interested in um, ancient cave art, um, and she took a research trip or two with students to go to actually visit the, the caves in France and Spain, or I think one of them, they, they're not letting people in anymore because the CO2 in our breathing um, deteriorates the paintings. Um, so I think one of the places in France, if I remember, not from her, but from a magazine article, I think they rebuilt you know, they uh, built a mock-up of the cave <laughs> very authentically, but she was really inspired by this idea. Um, in part because uh, there's also research that seems to point to the fact that a lot of the original cave artists were women, um, based on, you know, hand measurements and things like that. Um, the other thing that was really exciting was that, um, you know, it's thought that these, these drawings were placed in specific places in the caves um, 
based on one, how lamplight would flicker and kind of animate the painting, but also based on, um, there's fairly good evidence to say that it was based on um, resonant areas of the cave. So places where if you sung or chanted, um, that that you would get kind of a you know little feedback system and 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 these different pitches uh, uh, propagating uh, and sustaining themselves in the cave. Um, so our original concept, um, the first code I wrote for this uh, was in Super Collider, and uh, we wanted to kind of try to replicate that idea of early man in the cave or early early mankind in the cave and uh, have it to where people would need to walk around the space and hum or sing. And then it did pitch detection. And when you hit the right pitch, it would, it would ring out. Now, obviously it, you have a, 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 the very great possibility of a terrible and ridiculous feedback loop happening if you're actually feeding back from the participant's voice uh, back through the system. So um, my first piece of code actually would, um, it was actually just playing back a sample, you know, uh, you know, at the, at the, the required pitch that they had sung. Um, and in the end, our group, which was enormous, uh, we had Sarah from art, we had a couple people from architecture, we had a couple uh, people from computer science that dealt with networking all these Raspberry Pis and doing the data analysis that would change uh, the sound and the lighting. Uh, we had a recent grad who was a double major in computer science and music tech. Um, we had a neuroscientist. We had, uh, it was a very large, large and slow moving ship. So by the time we got all the money um, to buy all this stuff and put it together, I think we were, and, and you know, just all the conceptualizing and what are, what are viewer participants going to respond to best. Um, it was, I think, four years before um, we actually got the installation out there uh, into the public. So um, what you're seeing here um, is just kind of a general overview. This is in the uh, Holter Gallery in Helena, which is the capital of Montana. Um, it's about, oh, an hour and a half or so away from Bozeman. Uh, we had a really large gallery space. So um, these kind of domes made out of fiber optic cable you were seeing in that particular space, we had room to easily comfortably fit five of them. Um, so there are these five, uh, we call them cave forms. So they're supposed to be like your own little mini cave. Um, up at the top here, you can sort of see um, in this box is an individual speaker and a Raspberry Pi um, that takes the data from the brainwave reading headset. And um, so that's the basis of the, the interactive part of the installation. And then there are actually six projectors projecting uh, video on the walls. That was a video made by Sarah, the art professor, her, her drawings. Um, and then in the four corners of the room, you can sort of see we had some speakers here. Um, that was an ambient soundtrack um, consisting of, oh, a sound world that was supposed to kind of uh, be cave-like. Um, so Jason Bolte did this, uh, Professor Thompson knows him, um, but it had sounds of water dripping, sounds of like rock on rock, um, sounds of whispering. And that, that kind of, that, that runs the entire time. Um, the idea being kind of to set the mood and then also kind of to draw a viewer participant in. You know, if you see a completely uh, darkened gallery in an art museum, you, you might not go in, but if you have a little audio, it makes it a little more inviting. So those were the different parts of, uh, of the setup. And, you know, for any of you that might be really into the idea of brainwave data, um, again, this, this is art-based science. Um, how good is the science part of it? It could be argued that it's pretty bad, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because the headset we used uh, for financial constraints is actually, I mean, when they really, when neuroscientists really do this work, they have the, the contacts that they kind of glue onto your head. Um, and there's a researcher, and I'm forgetting his name, but out at the University of Washington in Seattle that said, 
you know, you're not going to really get accurate brainwave reading data on anyone um, unless they're, I think he said they're paralyzed or they're asleep. Uh, because other things, especially with these cheap setups or even with the better setups, supposedly, um, getting good, clean brainwave data that isn't affected by external factors that aren't the brainwaves is, is actually kind of difficult. Um, nevertheless, again, it's sciencey, it's science ish based, and it's really fun, cool, interactive art. Um, so this is another picture. This is our architect. She actually designed, she and Bill, uh, Bill Clinton, not, not the ex-president, the architect, uh, designed these. So we had 3D printed uh, custom made connectors and this was just some uh, carbon fiber cable and hundreds of feet of this side emitting fiber optic cable and there's the little headset. It's called a Mindwave. You can, you can buy them online. They're fairly cheap. Um, and it comes with like a software app that, uh, you know, you can kind of monitor if you're extra meditative or, or what's going on in your brain as you do certain tasks. So um, my part of this, again, was doing the interactive audio uh, generated by viewer participant brainwaves. So we have, what is it? Uh, there's five on my slide here. I think in reality, I want to say there's six or seven. Um, but these are your different brain waves that will increase in amplitude based on your mental state or whatever kind of mental tasks you're doing. Um, and they're actually super low frequency, as you can see. So your delta waves uh, from a half to a whole three hertz um, is what becomes prominent when you're in deepest meditation, dreamless sleep, uh, suspended external awareness, um, and also, uh, also affiliated with our source of empathy, um, all the way up to your, your gamma waves, um, all the way up to 42 hertz there. So when you're more mentally active, so when you're um, actively processing information, um, especially using different parts of your brain and bringing those uh, all together. So that's what the headset, or at least a, headset, a subset of what the headset um, could pick up. And if you've never worked in a really large group like this, <laughs> one of the really interesting things about this kind of collaboration is that there's, there's a lot of people with their hand on the steering wheel. So it's not just, you know, coming up with technical solutions that you think are like artistically valid or, you know, that somebody's going to want to hear. You also have to get the stamp of approval from the majority of the group. Um, so, uh, we ended up using, and luckily they, they approved of what I thought would be a good idea fairly early in the process. So yay, that was great. Um, but what I ended up doing is mapping on um, these different brainwave amplitudes onto the partials of the harmonic series. So again, yes, I'm sonifying, but I mean, it's pretty darn basic. Um, so each of the different brain waves was just mapped onto a partial of the harmonic series. Um, this is a little uh, example down here of the kind of values that you that you get from there. Um, and I think uh, interestingly, one of these is is that signal. I want to say it's in the signal column. Um, there's actually a, 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 a signal that these headsets can uh, read that happens when you blink. Um, so uh, our CS folks use that in conjunction with, you know, just the presence of any data to know when the person took the headset off. And then that particular little mini cave form, that little dome with the fiber optic cable wrapped around it would shut down. So it would stop. Um, it would stop playing audio and the color of the light was a little trickier for Chris to figure out. Um, obviously, if you're doing audio, you know, the whole point of sonification, you can have multiple data streams. So, you know, harmonic series that made a lot of sense. It was easy, but you can't really do anything quite similar with brainwave data mapping onto light. Um, so what he ended up doing was just taking the delta wave and depending on the um, amplitude of the delta wave, the light would go from, and I think you could see in some of those, um, anywhere from kind of a, a pink or a rose color to more of a purple or blue color um, is what the light does. And uh, I just have a little demo here if you're curious to hear what some of this sounded like. So what, what the CS people added to this was that um, 
So brain waves come in, uh, they change the lighting, uh, the data is sent via OSC message to the Raspberry Pi, um, which, which for John, uh, when I started this project, um, pals with one of the super collider developers who gave me the great advice to not do this project in super collider. Now, by the present time, or maybe a couple years ago, um, I'm aware of uh, some people having a lot of good success running Super Collider on a Raspberry Pi. But at the time, uh, Josh just warned me off of it, said, don't do it. So it's, it's actually running C sound, um, which again, I'm dating myself. Um, but it, it ran perfectly. Uh, this thing was up in Helena from, I wanna say August through late December or early January never had a single crash ran all day so it was super stable um that's what we're running so what the cs people added in was the um analysis of all the brainwave data um to where when one or more when two or more people um were had similar brain waves um the sound changes from kind of this running um slightly drony texture to kind of a pulsation and the more once they reached a threshold the more in sync in sync the brain waves were the faster it would pulsate so i think this example maybe not the best example but you hear a little pulsating just to give you kind of a taste of what you would hear from inside the installation So you can hear a little pulsing there. So, I mean, to get it to work, obviously you have to have people in the installation. So I recorded that on um, a sound field, ambisonic mic, obviously that's a stereo mix, but um, uh, so you hear some walking around and there's some ventilation noise in there, but that's a general, um, a general idea of the sound. So each one of the forms are actually tuned in perfect fifths just because, you know, it all blends, uh, all blends into a nice harmony by the time you stack up five perfect fifths onto each other. And again, even though we weren't asking anyone to perform or sing or hum to get that resonance or the pseudo resonance started, um, there were still people that um, were too shy to actually put a headset on and, and walk around the space or just sit under their cave, cave form. But, and again, there's, there's just an inherent problem in documenting any kind of installation. It, it's, you literally had to be there, you know, to make it really makes sense no matter how good your video and your your audio uh, documentation are but um, one of the things that's really fun about the installation is if you're not um, if you're not participating if you don't have the headset on or even if you do um, the way the sound changes between this large space and the five different forms as you're walking around um, in the gallery so you sort of safe space uh, self spatialize the audio for yourself um, as you're walking around and that was uh that was pretty interesting. So, you know, the overall sound world, it, it changes enough, I like to think, to, to be, you know, fairly interesting. Obviously, there's the magic moment when things start pulsing. Um, so it's fairly minimalistic. Um, and we actually had reports, they had docents, um, you know, there to assist if anything went wrong, you know, call me in my office at school. Again, the only time anything went wrong was when uh, some of the docents like didn't power up a speaker or two. Um, but I could, I could tap in over the internet and check out the system and, and see what was wrong and, you know, just be like, nothing's wrong on my end. Let's, let's make sure the little power lights are on everything. Um, so we had reports from one of the docents whose daughter had a lot of anxiety issues that um, she came into the installation and just found it like incredibly calming, right? Fairly subdued lighting, um, fairly, you know, droney audio. And I, I thought that was really interesting. So it, it's always really interesting to either watch how people react to an installation or, um, or, or at least hear about it. So that was, uh, that was pretty interesting. I liked that about it that it had some kind of, you know, uh, functional 
functional purpose for at least someone, uh, you know, outside of the artistic aspect. So um, that's my last slide on this particular piece. So I think it might be might be good to break for questions. I have a question. So under what yes under what circumstances did it occur that all of these different people came to work on this project? That's really interesting. Um, oh, is there a fundamental? <laughs> um, what circumstances? Well, um, luckily before I got here, so I got here a year after Jason and the year before we had a, a very up and coming um, physicist on the physics faculty um, that got a big grant to do um, a project on Einstein. I think it was some kind of anniversary or, uh, you know, uh, of his, his birth or, or something, but a lot of interest in Einstein. And so he got this really big grant to do kind of art science things. So um, they commissioned a composer um, to do an orchestra piece. Um, they had a dance troupe that did some original choreography. Um, they had just a series of events. And one of the things that they got funding for was another installation um, that Jason and Sarah, and I wanna say Jessica, the woman in the, the photo with the headset on, with the dark hair, not this, not this woman, um, but they had already done an installation. And, um, you know, that one was really successful um, in part, uh, it, it, this logistically is pretty complicated. Um, so it was sort of that same group of people. And then when they realized they wanted to, you know, in the next installation to do something interactive, uh, Jason said, oh, we got to get Linda on board for this. So um, it, it was kind of helped along by the fact that these people had already worked together um, and had, you know, some really great success uh, on a different installation is how it happened. Uh, we're also kind of all next to each other, like the next building uh, north of us uh, houses architecture and the next building north of that houses art. So, you know, and CAA, uh, College of Arts and Architecture, I, I don't know, I think we tend to be kind of a close knit uh, community on campus, so. Uh, yeah, I always find it interesting, you know, because the things you've talked about, you've predicated as being, well, you know, it's it's not necessarily true to the science, like I'm, I'm making music or I'm making art. And, I, you know, I, there's a lot of, um, a lot of projects like this or a lot of adventures like this where I often think that the the role of the arts here can be kind of PR in a sense, but also just to stir the imagination of participants who probably will not get the rocket science lecture, uh, but will certainly be inspired enough to maybe investigate on their own. I'm curious right. what, your, what your view yeah, on, on that role might be. Music as PR? Let me change that. Let me say music Music as inspiration for uh, scientific subjects. Ah, well, no, I think you're absolutely right um, that there are a lot of people out there. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a household where you know, my, my dad was a chemical engineer and he was very encouraging um, that my sister and I, you know, do well academically and that we be involved in the sciences. Um, so that's kind of where I think a lot of the reason I arrived at, at where I am now. But yeah, definitely. I think there are people out there that, um, you know, spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down that, you know, maybe we can get the average person more interested in science uh, because the average person is very interested in music. Uh, I think, I, I don't think I'm being biased. Right, because we we both have gotten that right as uh, as academics, you know, people wanting to be a music major because they love music so much. Uh, to which I never say this out loud, but you know, I love food a lot, but I can't smell, so I'll never be a top notch, you know, Cardon Bleu chef, <laughs> right? So yeah, absolutely, I think that is that is a way, and you know, again, I've been very unapologetic that. I mean, there, there are things about sonification and about technology that where we can involve audio and make it, you know, very, very 
um, uh, pertinent or relevant, whatever you want to say, to the hard science and, and getting uh, furthering the progress of science. Um, and then there's maybe things that are science light um, that are interesting ideas that help us make art. And, uh, you know, I would welcome the chance to work with a scientist and do sonification uh, for science, uh, but that's hasn't happened yet. Um, so, and I'm, and I'm fine with that. You know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, like I just said, these headsets can be a little wonky, brainwave can be a little wonky, but when you go into the gallery, the average person or the concert hall, the average person doesn't, doesn't mind that too much. They're, they're fairly forgiving. Um, so there was a question in the chat just about pitch. Um, that's easily reprogrammable. Um, I picked a note based on the specs of the speaker and wanting to have some good bass in there and knowing, you know, how testing the speaker and knowing how low I could get, you know, that was still uh, within a good range for the speaker and then not wanting the highest note to be too, you know, uh, too ear splitting um, and harsh. So again, that was just a little experimenting once we actually got the speakers and the gear and uh, very easily reprogrammable. Um, you know, pick a note, type in the, the frequency in Hertz and, and you're off to the races. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, I've been told like uh, about an hour and 15 minutes would probably be a good time frame, and we're at an hour now. Um, the last thing I had up there, whoops, was <laughs> my most recent video. Um, so this was my sabbatical project piece. Um, I don't know. I'll just I'll just play it. It's a movie. And let me get all these things off my screen. All right. So this is called Still Shining. Thank you. 
Very nice. All right. Thank you. Whoops. Oh, so nice. We're going to do it twice. <laughs> um, yeah. So again, you know, uh, doing any kind of video work or visual music has been something that, um, you know, I was interested in from the time I was in grad school. Um, but between, uh, yeah, I, I, I played flute a lot in grad school. I kind of, like I said, I'd be, uh, writing code for, you know, pretty much an entire day. And I'd come home, you know, uh, after dinner time and make dinner and then flute and wine until bedtime. <laughs> so, um, but, but it was always, always something I had wanted to do. Um, but I just, you know, I didn't have the resources time-wise. Um, you know, my, my previous job was at a um, not nearly as well-funded school. So I taught six course numbers per semester. Um, and two of those were one-on-one -on -one meetings. So I did flute studio and I did senior capstones, which were, I like to do as, as private lessons. And so uh, my first year here in Montana, um, they had, uh, you know, grants you could apply for to do a creative work. And uh, both my, my previous video, if you want to see it, it's on Vimeo. Um, both my previous uh, video was was funded through this grant, um, as well as the flute piece. Uh, but of course, that was um, you know fairly fairly cheap uh, financially to do. So all I asked for was a course release so that I'd have you know the, the time to 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 compose more uh, during the semester and keep up with grading and all that good stuff. So um, yeah, so that was my second video work, and uh, yeah really fun, fun to do stuff. And uh, I do, I do teach a course in it. Uh, it was on the books before I got here, but it's called Inter Interdisciplinary Projects One. Uh, we have a one and a two. One is visual music. Um, so we start off just getting people used to handling a camera uh, by doing some experimental film. And I invite in a colleague um, uh, that, that is a, you know, filmmaker. He actually has a production company and works with uh, Casey Anderson. I don't know if he, he does shows on, oh, like Discovery Channel and Nat Geo. Um, nature films, you know, wildlife films is a lot of what uh, my colleague does. And uh, it's really great talking about, you know, camera angles and what they mean. And we do film history. And um, after that, we kind of dive in uh, full bore and their, their final video project is uh, a visual music piece. Um, yeah, so questions, comments? I have a question about um, this, this latest video work um uh, i really uh, enjoyed uh, the enjoyed the colors and i'm always curious about why people make the selections they make with color and how do you choose that Ooh, oh again um yeah is is my answer good okay here's here's my true answer um unless i see something it's I look at my video work as being a lot like my audio work, right? So the whole idea of, uh, and that's how you get a student in one semester to make a pretty cool visual music piece is you just, you point out all the analogies between the two fields, right? We know how to capture source materials digitally. We know how to manipulate them into something new and hopefully interesting and or beautiful and or meaningful in some way. So unless there's a big problem with the color that maybe I like the motion, I like the shapes, I like everything but the color, I might go change the color. But as a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever done that. I mean, I know how, <laughs> but I've never found it necessary. So the colors that you, you're seeing there are maybe not intentionally a choice. You know, I had the choice to change them if I were too dissatisfied, if I thought they were ugly or gross or something, uh, but I didn't, I didn't change the color. So the colors you're seeing are uh, when I go from my source material to a couple few layers of fairly basic effects, that's the color it is. And, and I left it like that. Well, yeah, what it, what it reminded me of was um, a couple things. One was, you know, stained glass colors was kind of what it, reminded me of and and then it also reminded me of sort of a historical the clavelux i think it was called by somebody wilfred maybe 
Um, so a, a classic instrument where it was just playing with light. And, and because of the title of the piece, I, I wondered if you had any uh, similar, if I was just uh, seeing that for, my, for myself, which is fine, or if you had the same ideas. No, that's that's really great, and I haven't I haven't. If you could if you could find me that info, what it what Klavaluk and the last name was what? Oh, it's so terrible. This is being recorded, but um, oh no, I think no, no. oh sorry. I th I can't remember. Um, I'm not that embarrassed, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Klavaluk and it's this is from you know um, the 1920s or 30s, and uh, just an instrument played purely. Uh, to to make light move as as music, um, similar stuff. What were you saying, Ryan? It's Thomas Wilfred. Yeah, Andrew got it. Thomas Wilfred. Yeah. Well, I had it. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, no, really interesting, right? Because that's definitely something I cover in uh, in my class. Um, you know, these old color organs and uh, you know the whole concept of the seven color rainbow spectrum when it's not seven colors, but you know, seven is a magical number, right? So, um, sorry, there's a question in there somewhere and I lost it already. Oh, I was, I was saying, um, was I, I mean, the, I, I guess I had two things, stained glass and the Clavalux. And I, I think we've, we've gotten to like, the Clavalux wasn't an intentional thought at all. And, and I wondered about the stained glass idea. Um, or, you know, I guess what I'm, I'm hammering at here is, you know, um, I think that these choices get made intuitively, right? And, and to not change them, I think is what you're saying is also a choice. Um, but I'm just right. curious, you know, what, what those, what the general feel of the visual um, inspires in you? Um, you know, again, it's like, uh, it's like when I record audio that I'm gonna process, you want, you want something about that audio that you think is inherently beautiful and or interesting. Um, and that could be a lot of things. It could be, you know, if you're rattling something around that it makes neat rhythms or you're bowing a gong and, you know, when you filter that, you can get, you know, amazing things out of it. So I look at my visual sources um, the same way is that you, you know, the more you do it, the more, you know, when I pass it through these eight processes, this is what my output's going to look like. But again, there's just a lot of experimentation. And, um, you know, because I had the gift of sabbatical, um, I experimented with a lot of different visual sources and, you know, kind of towards the end of it, I think I finished it in about March. Well, it's not really finished. I mean, it'll, it'll be finished. Um, the, the first performance where we can actually all be together in a hall. And I'm the type that I just, I will keep tweaking a work till the last minute I'll get it performed. I'll tweak it some more. So there's some things in there I don't love but what happened is, is it was getting to the end um and i often work sectionally even with my visual uh, materials and you know where you you try to figure out how they're all going to fall together and i said you know and i think somebody somebody might have hinted on this something about you know how the a lot of the textures in the flute piece are the same um, yeah, I have really mellowed with age. Uh, there was a point where my music was super intense and all the extended techniques all the time and all the notes and all the rhythms. And I find, especially over the past, you know, maybe seven years or so that I'm getting a little more minimalistic. I'm getting a little more relaxed. Um, but, but my first video is many, many worlds, right? So many visual sources, piled up on top of each other and a lot of different segments, a lot of different visuals. As this was coming to the point where I really had to start thinking about how it's all gonna fall together, um, I was looking at the materials from just one visual source. And I said, you know what? There's, there's enough here and it's beautiful and interesting enough that why don't you have the courage to for once, <laughs> you know, go with one, go with that minimalism, just go with it. Um, and in the end it worked. So, you know, that entire video is, is one concrete visual source, um, you know, different angles filmed with a macro lens. So sorry, I'll just, in case you're, is anyone curious what my source was? I am. Yeah, I am. Starring, I don't even know what to call this. That's awesome. Um, it was not, 
It was not from Christmas time. I actually bought this. I don't know when it's, it's from Michael's it's from a craft store. I have no clue what this is supposed to be. Obviously it's something you would want to hang on your backpack or your belt loop, of course. Uh, but it's just this little iridescent cush ball made out of plastic. Wow. Um, that's it. Every, every image in that, except, okay. The very last where there's the little washes, um, is actually some of this, which again is like iridescent, I don't know, I guess tinsel or something. So that's often how a video piece starts for me is a walk through the craft store and grabbing at shiny things like a little five-year-old. <laughs> Do you find that the craft, the craft store you choose makes a difference? Michael's, Hobby Lobby, I mean that I will research and get back to you because we just, we just, you know, Bozeman, Bozeman, I think when I moved here in 2012 was about 20,000 people. We just got a Hobby Lobby. We just oh. got a Hobby Lobby and I haven't been into it yet, but. I sense have. another visual music piece on the horizon. So not Definitely. too long, not too generalized, but I think of Bozeman as being a little bit provincial. And I'm surprised um, how goes over there. Input. I'm sorry, you're you're cutting out a little. You're surprised, okay. and then I couldn't. Can you start from you're surprised? Uh, you have like a very East Coast West Coast high art aesthetic, and you're in a small town, Bozeman. I'm I'm wondering how well they accept it, or how how well. Like how many students come from Montana that are into this kind of thing? Maybe I'm just completely wrong though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. The thing you have to understand is that universities do not hire, I mean, except for adjuncts when we need a person that teaches a class or two, which is really difficult. It, it can be, it, it's getting easier, but it was really difficult to find adjuncts in music technology in Montana. Um, but faculty are not locals. Um, you know, this was a, you know, we're, we're technically the research one university of Montana, um, not, not the Grizz over in Missoula. It's us here in Bozeman, the Bobcats. Um, so, you know, these, these jobs are, are, are national searches. Uh, so, you know, faculty can and are from anywhere. Um, you know, kind of the irony is that uh, Dr. Bolte and I actually grew up about three hours from each other. He was, he's from Southern Indiana, I'm from Southern Illinois. So the chances of that happening are pretty strange. But, um, you know, I think it's true just knowing my own background coming from small town Illinois that uh, I remember uh, my flute teacher who had played in the St. Louis Symphony had suggested I go to this concert at a venue called the Shelton in downtown St. Louis and they did a contemporary music concert and this was my senior year of high school and I knew I was gonna go off to school and be a music composition major um, and, and play a lot of flute or maybe even get a minor in flute or you know I wasn't quite sure. And I remember going to this concert and hearing this contemporary music, there was some Libby Larson and there was some you know, even more kind of atonal, really avant-garde stuff. And I remember leaving that concert thinking, not quite knowing what to think, um, but also being kind of assured that I would probably never hear music like that again. So fast forward a couple few months and uh, I go off to college and I see a poster in the music building that's a, a joint faculty recital between uh, two composition faculty. And I go in and, and one of the draws for me, again, this is before computers were a household item like a toaster or a television. And it said a concert of computer music. And at the time it was like, what the heck do these two things have to do with each other, especially if you're a 17 year old from a small town in Southern Illinois, um, right? So I went to the concert and I said, oh my goodness gracious, it's that same kind of thing that I heard back home near St. Louis at the Sheldon. So, you know, talking about, yeah, we have a lot of ranchers. Uh, it, it's a beautiful thing to see a pickup truck that actually has mud and uh, other farm uh, substances all over it. and. You know, when you see the people walking in class in the cowboy boots and the cowboy hats, they're, they're, they're not doing it for show, right? It's not 80s fashion where cowboy stuff was in. We do literally have a lot of uh, students that are coming from farming and ranching backgrounds. 
So just like me, the ones that are interested uh, recognize the value in diversifying. Uh, you know, like if you talk to even really famous filmmakers that do, you know, blockbuster, uh, you know, very uh, accessible films and you read interviews with them, they'll point out how important experimental film was to their development and how it's made them the filmmakers um, that they are today. So I think even, you know, on the music side, uh, we get a lot of students that, um, you know, realize again, the importance of, of diversifying the art, you know, to kind of help you, um, if not for technical things, then to kind of help you frame where you are in the universe of what you think you want to do, uh, present new possibilities. And the other thing that I heard from other colleagues um, is that because of that background, uh, because of that farming and ranching, uh, you know, when I lived in Ohio, um, it was near a really big Amish community and you would literally see like a five-year-old kid bringing the horse team in. So this idea that on the farm, everybody has to help out from a very young age, I think there's kind of this attitude of, of just self-sufficiency, of, you know, making and doing things for yourself. Uh, you know, we, we have bears out here in the yard and moose. So this, you know, this kind of bravery that you grew up in grizzly country and a weird video can't hurt you. <laughs> you know, so I think, I think the students here are actually, um, you know, pretty open to it. We definitely get a good amount of people that just want, um, you know, want to do live sound, want to work front of house um, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, kind of, kind of continuing on with what their idea of what music technology is. But we also get, you know, a smaller percentage of people that want to go on to grad school or want to go on and get a CS degree and, and write the plugins for Pro Tools instead of actually dealing with, you know, musicians in the studio and Pro Tools. So it's a good place. It's, it's, you know, it's accepted. And I think for the ultimate acceptance, uh, your teacher can, can, can verify, you know, a lot of times we, we just have to go to conferences all together. <laughs> I think that's where we get um, maybe a lot of our best support uh, is from other people across the country, you know, maybe in Nebraska or or somewhere that like that doing doing something similar to what we do. I don't know. We're pretty hot in Statesboro. <laughs> people, yeah, people, come, people come from Metter or even Millen, sometimes Claxton. They'll come all the way to Statesboro into town to hear what we have to say. Nice. Well, I mean, where else are they going to go, right? Where are you going to go? I'm not sure. Drive all the way to Atlanta? Probably well, not. Is, probably not. Um, yeah, well, this has been a really great talk. I really appreciate you sharing your work with us and what you do. I think it's inspiring. Um, I like the trajectory of the things you presented to us to show this intersection of technology and music and art. That's very impressive work. And um, I think if it's okay with you, I will pass your email on to the students in case they have additional questions that they weren't able to ask um, during this time. And, and we'll pass you Thomas Wilfred's uh, Clavalux link Excellent. and uh, I'll let you look at that. Um, Thank you again, and I'm, I'm going to end the meeting now on Facebook. I'll just say goodbye to our Facebook brethren. Bye, Facebook. And uh, then I'll stop recording the video, so goodbye all.